So, okay, uh, welcome, uh, John Baldacchino, um, the, our guest speaker for this evening. Uh, John Baldacchino is Professor of Arts Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he also served as the director of the Division of the Arts between 2016 and 2019. Uh, this year, he has also been appointed Professor to Western Norway University in Bergen, a graduate of the Universities of Malta and Warwick. He was a member of faculty at Columbia University in New York and the Universities of Dundee, Falmouth, Robert Gordon and Warwick in Britain. A specialist in art, philosophy and education, he's the author of many journal articles, reviews, catalog essays and journalistic contributions. To date, John Baldacchino has published 14 books, which include Education Beyond Education, Self and the Imaginary in Maxine Green's Philosophy, Makings of the Sea, Journey, Doubt and Nostalgia, Arts Way Out, Exit Pedagogy and the Cultural Condition, John Dewey, Liberty and the Pedagogy of Disposition, and Art as Unlearning Towards a Mannerist Pedagogy. He is also the author of Histories and Philosophies, the International Encyclopedia of Art and Design Education, published by Wiley Blackwell in 2019, and his first two books, Post-Marxist Marxism and Easels of Utopia, originally published in 1996 and 1998, have now been recently republished by Routledge. In 2020, he published two new books, Say Sip Limitu Uhelsin, uh, published by Club Called Maltin and educating, edu educing Ivan Illich. Sorry about that. Reform, contingency, and disestablishment. Now, he is currently working on two new volumes one on art and belonging, and a book on Gian Battista Vigo and the pedagogy of form. Uh, it is worth saying that this seminar, or, well, I mean, the launch of Say El Asip was meant to take place in pre COVID times. It looks like, like it's been donkey's years it's really been a, a little bit over a year since we planned that one so now we also have that retrospect on say as a work of philosophy in Maltese, and uh, we look forward to um to um, listening to to john i'd like now to invite uh, professor jean paul baldacchino the director of the military institute to uh, say a few words uh, followed by uh, another uh, brief address by Professor Carmel Kassar, Director of the Institute of Maltese Studies. So over to you and everyone enjoy the lecture. Um, thank you, Norbert. Um, let me say it is a great pleasure to be able to host together with the Institute of Maltese Studies a seminar of this nature. It is uh, doubly interesting to me because Firstly, it allows us to form bridges between entities within the university when it comes to topics which are which of converging interests, and that looks at Malta not simply in an insular sense, but Malta in terms of its Mediterranean identity and its Mediterranean dimensions. So we work a lot uh, together, and for me, this is the way forward for how university research is to develop, but it's also a collaboration on an international uh, level that we're also able to host uh, Professor Baldacchino's seminar, Creating Bridges with scholars interested in the topic of Malta, Maltese and the Mediterranean, not simply located in the Meds in Malta, but also a transcontinental, if you will, uh, connection. And uh, secondly, it is a topic which is particularly interesting because it, I think, poses an underlying challenging question. How can we think not about the Mediterranean, but how can we think the Mediterranean? How can we go beyond conceiving of the Mediterranean as simply a site where research takes place, a site which economists and historians have long documented the interconnectivity and let's say the channels of communication, but actually see if there is a scope of uh, looking at the Mediterranean in terms of outlook, whether it be more aesthetics, whether it be in the domain of uh, perhaps philosophical perspectives, can we speak of the Mediterranean as perhaps a style? And I think this is where questions of 
art and the way in which we uh, conceive our Mediterranean imagery and the sort of issues that Professor Balakino's talk seems to raise when it comes to how can you think philosophically in Maltese and how does that create a form of thinking which is, uh, let's say, unique and uh, the challenges that that brings forward. So I look forward to hearing Professor Balakino's uh, presentation on the topic. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Balakino and Professor Kassa. Thank you very much. Actually, <laughs> uh, Jean Paul has <laughs> said a lot of <laughs> what I had in mind. Actually, um, I can't um, I can't agree with what he just said more than than that. Actually, as director of Malt of the Institute of Multi Studies, which I have been for the last couple of years, um, I'd like to say a few things connected to to this issue, um, which sometimes is a little bit lost in the sense that opportunities like this one should help us uh, think more Mediterranean rather than uh, rather than the way we in Malta usually think. And this is, uh, in my view, uh, sometimes can be a, quite a big problem because um, uh, we always think, uh, most times we think that we are actually a unique place. In reality, we have learned a lot from people um, actually that surround the Mediterranean. And we have learned from, 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 from all parts of the Mediterranean. And what you have on this island is actually the product of all these experiences put together. So I consider these islands more as a kind of a cauldron of, of, of ideas which have been Actually, it's kind of a, you know, it's like putting vegetables and, and, and other food items in a soup and it has been simmering for a very long time. And as a result of that, you end up, you end up, you end up with something which is particularly unique at times and even interesting. However, to stay on, to remain in unique and interesting, it has to be, we, we must rather continue to think um outside our shores um most times unfortunately we do not to do that um and this is um something which is may may actually not that doesn't always help us to move forward um having said that um i was particularly struck by the title of this the, the first couple of words of this of this book by Professor Baldacchino, um, and this the idea of the high trasse of the rubble wall, um, which I find particularly interesting. Um, even here, at one point, once up to some years ago, up to several decades ago, actually, I used to think that the high trasse is something which is ours. In reality, I I came across the high trasse all over the place. If you go to the south of Italy, I even saw Haitasei in Bulgaria. The interesting thing about the Haitasei, and there I want to say this because I'm essentially a historian of the 16th and 17th centuries. So um, I think I should say this. Um, this is a, a preoccupation that the Knights had to face in the running of this state of theirs. Why? Because the Haitasei actually was created difficulties for the knights to have a proper cavalry. You know, going from one place to another with all these boundary walls all over the place created a lot of problems to have a proper cavalry, to have a functioning cavalry. And in fact, they, they, they besides, although they had the infantry, the artillery and all the rest, um, they never managed, and even the Navy, they never managed to have a proper cavalry. And that's because this is an impediment which they found uh, exclusively in Malta. And this is very interesting because I think that if we were to look at this particular issue, um, um, these rubble walls, um, you know, sometimes we invent rubble walls, we create rubble walls, and these rubble walls create problems for, for all of us, for all of us to continue to develop, to move forward, to, to look outside uh, of our boundaries, 
And this is what I hope, um, that this would be one of, uh, of, of the ways in which we can actually start looking outside our, our, our small territory. Uh, definitely, Professor Baldacchino has managed uh, to do that extremely well, perhaps <laughs> very well, not, not extremely well is, 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 a, is, is a more precise word. However, um, I hope that more Maltese people manage to do this and so that we can move forward, really move forward, move forward, um, perhaps to a better future too. Thank you very much um, for agreeing to, to, to deliver this lecture today. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kassar. Uh, John Baldacchino, over to you, Rubble Walls of Contingency. Okay, let's let's see how this screen share works. Uh, Norbert, is it working? It is, it is. Yeah, it is. Great. So, uh, so I have, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to write this lecture partly because there are so many bits and pieces in it, which, which I don't want to miss. So I hope you forgive me for reading this lecture and every now and then have an argument or have a conversation with you. Uh, and if I'm going too fast, let me know. Uh, as you know, we Maltese tend to speak fast in all, all sorts of languages. So, so there we go. Anyway, so thanks for the, uh, for the introduction. Actually, it's quite interesting what Professor Castell was saying because um, it, <clears throat> it does bring up some of the, the, the questions and the possibilities in terms of the notion of a limit and how the limit becomes an opportunity. But also I thank um, Professor Baldacchino, my namesake of um, you know, framing this within, within the Mediterranean context, because those are two aspects which I'm going to bring together hopefully in this lecture. So, so I, I opened this lecture, these reflections with a note, which is very much tied to the fact that I grew up in Malta. Now, when I say I grew up, I don't simply mean that I was born and bred there, which is true, but rather I want to bring the whole notion of the formative effect and effect that birth and upbringing mean in terms of how one approaches thinking and how one grows up thinking by speaking a specific language. And I have to say, I should clarify this, that I grew up speaking Maltese only. We, we were not um, you know, bilingual. Um, family, you know, my parents spoke English like everyone else, but they spoke to us in Maltese. So, so in fact, actually, when I was at school, I had trouble with English, especially in primary school, like like most of the Maltese kids, which I found out when I was teaching them. So, anyway, this sounds tautological unless you begin to wonder how we have come to understand thinking as an act, as an action, but more importantly, how this action impacts on one's formative experience. I want to accentuate the formative aspect of this because from here, because form actually here plays a very important role. By form, I mean a lot of things, both in the sense of form in the philosophical realm, starting with Plato, but also moving into how the eidetic conceptualization of reality has evolved with different philosophers. But also I'm thinking of how form, qua form, that is the shape and being of a thing as a thing, belongs to the sphere of practice and living, where we engage with the things of everyday life, which in turn play a very important role in how we think. Coming from the creative arts, I also regard form as central to the way I approach the world in terms of what we make and what we do poetically in terms of thesis, and thereby implying an action on the world of making stuff by designing, by constructing, by dismantling, by destroying, by recreating things as objects, which in turn play a role of subjects in the meaning we give to the world. This implies an action, which again becomes part of the idea of thinking as a practice and as a way of living convivially. So I was recently doing some research on the work of the Ghanaian philosopher, Kwasi Wiredu, as I revisit an old paper which I wrote and presented in a conference on intercultural music many years ago, and elements of which I am now including in a book of essays about the notion of belonging. Uh, I believe Norma, Norbert mentioned that book. Uh, 
As I'm expanding this essay, I keep thinking back on how then I was attracted to Wiredu because he specifically dealt with African philosophy, but more importantly, on the philosophizing of African languages, which he engages with, especially his own language, which is the Akan language. The idea here is that philosophy in your own language is challenging, not simply in terms of how one can translate philosophical terms developed in languages like English, French, German, or Italian, but more importantly, in terms of the tenor, I would even say the tactility and figurality, and indeed the shaping by which we speak and do philosophy or art or literature or maths or even science. Now in his book, Cultural Universes and Particulars, an African Perspective, Wiredu does, not, does a lot of work on this idea, especially in how the Akan language challenges him as a professionally trained philosopher under the tuition of Gilbert Wright. As you know, well, those who know Wiredu, he studied basically in Oxbridge. So, I mean, he comes from that kind of tradition of people from former colonies, from colony, British colonies, going to Oxford or Cambridge and studying them. And this often gave ammunition to those critics, to his critics, as they attempted to reduce his work to logical positivism. Now, while he does reject this criticism, insisting that, that he is not a logical positivist, Wiredo does, does also make use of his affinity with a certain disciplined and precise way of doing philosophy. Now, because of this, he goes at some length to understand the relationship between how we speak and how certain concepts, like for example, Descartes' cogito, is reclaimed on different planes and from different or distinct different positions, especially when it comes, when it comes to be engaged through languages used in Africa. So just to cite one example, um, you can see how actually, um, and I could read this because uh, maybe it helps. Actually. So, so Wiredo argues that by far the most conceptually interesting African comment on Descartes, on his claim, was that made by Alex Kagame, who pointed out that throughout the Bantu zone, a remark like, I think, therefore I am, would be unintelligible. For the verb to be is always followed by an attribute or an adjunct of a place. I am good. I am big, et cetera. I am in such and such a place, et cetera. Thus the utterance, therefore I am, would prompt the question, you are, what? Well, where? Now, Wiredo goes on to explain that the Akan language, in the Akan language, there is also the challenge of being placed in a particular situation or position, or being in a particular state of being, which would imply that philosophy spe philosophically speaking, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum, cannot be fully transported philosophically more than linguistically to what the intent of the philosopher Descartes, but also the African philosopher who's speaking Cartesian in terms of what he's trying to say, in terms of the deed of philosophy, in terms of what philosophy is. So far from just a matter of translation, other questions emerge in how one could explain on the, could expand rather on the very notion of what we mean by being. And I would probably suggest how a Maltese Cartesian, like an African Cartesian, might well be challenged by the Francophone and Anglophone Cartesians, who may well realize that their ownership of this process of thinking is also very different. Now here, I do not want to go at length into this, but if you read the book we are discussing here, say Elasir, you will find that this was one of those issues that kept coming up for me. Not in terms of translatability of such texts, but in terms of the question, if I were to say, or think this concept in Maltese, what would it mean to me in terms of my own process of thinking and talking to Maltese speakers? Again here, the processing is not that of Cartesian thought, which may or may not be important for me. But the question, but the questions which prompted Descartes himself at the point of the cogito, so the, the existential questions of your life of the cogito, where his doubt somehow slipped into his claim of what was clear in terms of being. I remember when I used to study philosophy at INSERM, and those who don't know what INSERM is, INSERM was an institute which trained monks, basically, into philosophy and theology. I was going to become a monk. I was a postulant into the Carmelite order. And in those days, because the theology faculty was closed in the university, the certain orders of the monks, Carmelites, not the Dominicans, but the other Franciscans, they all came together and formed this institute. So we used to study philosophy there. On my first time, time studying philosophy, was actually very much conducted in conversations in Maltese. So in those days, I remember the guy who's teaching us Descartes, the, the word charo distinct used to be, had a sonority to it. It was quite, quite unique. 
But when it came to the Gorgito, it was always beautifully cited in Latin. I mean, given that perhaps Nachseb al did not have the same portent as Gorgito ergo sum. And let's not forget that the Incern was a church institution for the formation of the religious. So there is a very important aspect. So Uredo's concept is also important in other terms. He wrote these essays in response and moved, was moved by being in, in, in a historical context after the independence of Ghana, for example, which were bound to the narratives that emerged in post-colonialism. So the desire for a conceptual decolonization in Africa was naturally extended to a conceptual transformation in terms of African philosophy. In fact, my approach to Wiredu was originally prompted by my reaching, researching and writing about intercultural music. More specifically, I was discussing African composers such as Kwabena and Ketia, and also Akin Yuba, who in terms of their own musical art found themselves grappling with the same situations that philosophers did. I'm specifically thinking of the relationship between particularity and universality here, and which actually in terms of music, it becomes quite interesting because people like Akin Yuba and, and Nketiah, who were one of the first Africans who studied in Britain or in America, but then were writing African music or were writing a music which actually brought together um, a lot of the, 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 uh, the narratives that they inherited from missionaries who came from, from Britain and America, but also um, wanted to bring in African music, which is normally not written. So, I mean, these questions of the universality of music, if you like, and the particularity of those particular narratives, those particular, um, you know, expressions comes in, into, into, into question here. And that's what actually what Wiredu engages with. He engages with how universes in particular engage with each other, but also how cultural universes operate within particulars, or the other way around. So the post-colonial context also brings in a caveat to our treatment of language, which perhaps was best captured by Kwame Apia when he re remarks the following. It is interesting what Kwame Apia said, this is important to keep this in mind, because language here is of course a synecdoche. When the colonialists attempted to change the second cultural territory of the African, the instrument of pedagogy was their most formidable weapon. So the problem is not only, or not so much, the English or the French or the Portuguese languages as the cultural imposition that they each represented. The problem is colonial education, in short, produced a generation immersed in the literature of the colonies, a literature that often reflected and transmitted the imperialist vision. Now, I keep thinking also about the development of Maltese literature here, so there is a diverse a difference here, but this is important to keep in mind. Here, we're not talking just about language. This qualifier is important because here we are not claiming that language is simply resolved from the language. language, music, or philosophy, or anything we do, which will simply resolve history. If that was the case, then Malta's colonial condition, which I would argue is still very much alive and kicking, would have vanished quickly because we know that the movement to have Maltese at the center of institution and that's widespread use and evolution through literature, politics and religion has long been established. It was even established before independence. So the case here has nothing to do with simply translating and doing everything to Maltese. Because we also know that even when English is still predominant in the school and technical languages and where we still learn maths and science and almost everything else in English, Educators are also telling us that Maltese and English are suffering a dip in their usage in Malta, where more often than not, both suffer from a huge deficit in terms of literacy. Just look at how both Maltese are massacred, and both Maltese and English are massacred in social media, for example, amongst, amongst the Maltese population. But also in how often there seems to be a lack of real understanding of the roles that the two official languages in Malta play. Not to mention how Italian, for example, remains predominantly and widely spoken by the Maltese. Sometimes Maltese speak better Italian than English. And yet it has, the, it has lost the official role in Malta's institutions, which it had for centuries. I don't want to re-raise the language question in Malta, but it is interesting how Italian lost out in this whole situation. So we need to keep in mind the interplay between form and meaning in the sense of how form becomes a lived form or to think it with what I have discussed in this book to the idea of the lived body, le corps vécu, il jisem mayesh, of which we are all conscious as human beings, 
who manifest ourselves and our selves in the process of living. This is where I would bring together form and speech, but also looking at speech less in a textual manner and more in what Jean-Francois Lyotard calls the figura, the figure. In whose representation, we are not simply beholden to some forms of signification or symbolism, but to a, to a directness that is coveted, to use the translated word, by the need to see. If we lend the meaning of seeing to that of hearing, then perhaps one gets closer to what I mean by the act of speaking more peace. Something which I pushed and say, for example, in the concept of feeling and sensation, which in Maltese gives us some intriguing concepts that triangulate knowledge, thinking, and sensation in ways which go back to the Plotinian notion of aesthesis and how it was then used in Arab thought. Um, for example, see the, the, you know, I discussed this in, in, in the book under the, the, the section called the Show A Ulchos Talqsir. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, you know, show the Maltese version, but um, read the translation, which I hope makes sense, <laughs> because I did it. So in the framework of Semitic expression, thought is also a form of thinking in the sense of it folding onto itself from noun to verb. But there is also a context where one feels thought not merely in a sentimental way, that is by the senses, as we say, I feel I should do so, but in phenomenological moments where thinking on every level of its meanings finds that it has, it has also, it also has sounds and shapes that take on an aesthetic meaning. Thus, not only in the sense of meaning, but also that of sound, Semitic Maltese gives us the opportunity to find connections between thought and sound, both from the root of the word. And here I'm implying er as root in terms of meaning, but also in terms of its Semitic sounds of the consonants that make the word. And in what the word itself is saying. So the sound of thinking gives us two meanings, what one hears and what one feels. Here we are not alluding to a poetic way or a match between word or another. Rather, we are referring to what might be called the morphological aesthetics of the word, which is not only felt, but tasted and smelled. As Seamus Keeney once implied in his use of the word musk when he discusses language and words. Musk, somewhere between mold and musk, the confectionery this week, one smells it in one's own throat and tastes it as it hits one from within both, from within, in both a physical and psychological sense. So why we cannot speak of a Maltese philosophical tradition, or can we, I don't know, nor could we take the part which we read and African, Af African philosophers like Kwame Gyekia and to some extent Kwame Apia himself took in their attention to African oral traditions and popular thought, I would argue that the case for Maltese as a language that descends from its Semitic and Romance roots would allow us to formulate and visit forms of thinking and concepts that do emerge from the expression and tangibility, perhaps even the figurality, which this unique language gives us. Now I understand and accept the fact that we are Mediterranean, so therefore there is no uniqueness in the sense of what we claim often, you know, pastizzi and all that stuff. But actually, we also, as a language, Maltese has developed its own unique patois, if you like, its own unique development. I know this is very controversial, but I mean, as a language, it's unique. I mean, no one speaks Maltese, not even Arabs speak Maltese, although they find it easier for them to understand us than us understand them, at least that's my experience. But anyway, that's what I'm trying to say here. So this is why I keep insisting that here, the question of translatability is totally irrelevant. This is more of a question of being as an act of doing a doing, including doing philosophy, that in its portent of sound, sight, jest, form, and indeed manner, maniera in Italian, but also as a demeanor, opens a myriad possibilities and helps us reflect indeed backwards, perhaps, or inwards to the things, what the Italians called le cose and the French le choses, the Greek, the pragmata of language itself. But here we are not referring to the forms of language by which we speak but the things by which we have a language that allows us as Maltese, or as Maltese speakers, to depict and represent the world as a horizon of historical contingency, which comes to the center of what I'm talking about now. So here I want to give you some context to say you have to see it in terms of my own thinking at the time and how, at the time I was writing it, and also how it partly was running in parallel with another book that I also published in 2020, 
which is adducing Ivan Illich reform contingency and disestablishment. Now, as I reflect on both books and how they took a different life, but also how they emerged and evolved over the several years of thinking, it is somehow fortuitous that they were published in the same year. The point of convergence, which I want to mention here, though there are many of them, is the concept of contingency and how via Illich, but also in my reflections or rather my awareness of the contingency of language, which Richard Rorty developed, I constantly run in this concept in parallel. In this respect, as I prepared for this lecture, somehow one of the parts of the jigsaw came latently in terms, came to me latently in terms of how perhaps unconsciously Rorty's chapter on the contingency of language and his contingency, his book, Contingency, Irony and Solidarity, had also some latent influence on me when I was writing both books. It is somehow interesting how while Rorty triangulates contingency with irony and solidarity, I am, I, in my writing and studying of Illich, I triangulated reform contingency with this establishment. And as I read back on the chapter on contingency in, in, in the book on Illich, I couldn't not mention this as it also carries meaning in terms of what I'm here calling the rubble walls of contingency. Being in the main, the language's rubble walls, if you like, they wanted to put it in a forceful way. So here, I do not want to diverge too much, but I want to bring up four approaches to contingency, which I discussed in my Illich book, but which must be kept in mind when reading Sayyid Hersir. So I, I cite four people here because it's important. One is Agnes Heller, the other one is Illich himself, then Richard Rorty and Dun Scotus, the medieval philosopher. So actually, Heller talks about cosmic contingency and historic contingency. Cosmic contingency is more to do with the whole idea of how we look at the universe, especially from the um, Christian Judaic tradition of the fall. So from this moment onwards, she says, from the fall of Adam and Eve, and here we need to think about it in a metaphorological way. We're not thinking about it, you know, I mean, Agnes Heller, she studied with Lukács, as far as I know, she was not even a, cre um, a, cre um, a believer, but it's interesting how in these, these legends and these myths actually, we, we begin to understand what contingency is, is to us. So from this moment onwards, men and women must choose on their own and they must respond. That is, they must take responsibility. Contingency is the loss of innocence, Heller argued. But actually Illich is interesting because Illich looks at contingency from what he calls it at sunset, which came according to him when humans decided that rather than leave it to God, we took our understanding of the universe away from God and took it in our hands. So a contingent nature, as it's known, is gloriously alive, but it is also uniquely vulnerable to being purified and cleaned of its aliveness in the sense of contingency. So basically, when we, while Heller is seeing contingency as a moment of liberation, um, Illich sees it differently, but he also sees it in, as a moment of hope, but his hope is infested in how he looks back at con contingency from a medieval Franciscan approach, which he adopts from Bonaventura and Dun Scotus. So Rorty, to, to, to give you a bit more context, he says that if, if we could ever be, become reconciled to the idea that most of reality is indifferent to our descriptions of it, and that the human self is created by the use of a vocabulary rather than being adequately or inadequately expressed in vocabulary, then we should at last have assimilated what was true in the romantic idea that truth is made rather than found. Here, I think Roti is trying to avoid falling between the two stools of relativism and determinism. And in a way, his optimistic um, pragmatism comes true. But perhaps the best argument for contingency is what Don Scotus has argued in terms of what he calls the synchronic contingency, which is a synchronic contingency between contingency and universality. How could the world and its freedom be from contingent, but then at the same time, you know, acknowledge that there is God. So the far reaching impact of Scotus' theory of synchronic contingency becomes clearest in the concept of the will. God's will and man's will act within an ontological frame, which is a, a frame of being, which comes from us, which embraces innumerable contingent states of affairs together and with necess necessary states of affairs. Now, this is important for me because 
in this book, in Sayyid al -Hasir, I'll try to bring together immanence and transcendence, as I would argue. So this raises the question as to whether or how, in speaking, writing, and doing Maltese, would the horizon of contingency become specific to a dynamic relationship between cultural universes and the particulars? And here you need to bring also in mind the Mediterranean imaginary, which signifies that. In other words, why does contingency play such a central role in this work? And how does it begin to approach the relationship between limit and freedom? Leave me to what is here. So as a way of thinking that takes the form of Ravel, Sayyid, this condition challenges any logical method by which we've attempted to create the notion of a total human that can only be recognized by reason. This is because by the same way we should recognize the limits of our body and words, we must understand that reason remains insufficient. And the, the insufficiency of reason goes back to several philosophers, including Jaspers, who actually has influenced me when I was writing this book a lot. So, so this is where the image of a rubble wall, the height of Seyir, and I make a distinction between Haita Seyir and Seyir itself, because the word and the meaning of Seyir is quite ambiguous. I could kind of try to kind of try to understand what Seyir is, and, and it becomes quite interesting. So it's, it kind of carries this degree of ambiguity as a word and becomes a good analogy on several levels. And more specifically, in terms of how contingency itself is carried. So my analogy of the Haita Seyir has more to do with the Seyir itself rather than the Hetan, if you like, than the walls. So, so basically, it, 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 it has a great signification or great significance in terms of how contingency itself is carried. And in in, in, indeed, signified, though never closed in, the wider possibilities that the rubble wall, together with the context of its function, in terms of what the French call bocage, which is not just moralia, as in Italian, brings in. Now, what is this bocage? The bocage is actually the whole idea of the field with all these walls, which, which kind of divide it. So the function of a, a rubble wall is not just to compartmentalize a space or delineate borders, but it's also there to allow water flow through the walls and distribute it across the fields. So there is therefore a distributive, almost convivial element in how the compartments are not simple boundaries, but a porous redistribution of nourishment. The making of the wall. So, I mean, there's a function to the, to the, to the say, yeah, it's not just because they couldn't find any, you know, they just built it like that because that's what they found, but there's an element in it that allows the water to go through. And that becomes very porous. And that also helps in terms of how you can distribute water across the fields, especially when it rains. So the making of the wall itself is always fascinating because no one stone is like another. And often the accidental shape of the stone creates conditions for several possibilities which one cannot preordain, let alone plan. There's also the ecology that is found within the spaces of these stones. And this is not unlike the hedges, for example, which we find in Britain, where they are protected by the law because they have a very specific flora and fauna in them. And this provides an environment for a rich fauna that itself contributes highly to the unique ecology that is created within such, such structures. Uh, the Maltese imaginary is Seir has an immanent that is an internalized sense of belonging. It is not simply a characteristic of the landscape, but it brings out a sense of being within which one could almost imagine how the contingent nature of these walls is also inherent in how a Mediterranean way of life has grown around it. Just as crofting communities in the highlands become synonymous with the character and even nationhood of Scotland, especially considering how the clearances ordered by the landed gentry and the lairds represent the suppression of the Scots by the English landlords and the sheep and wool industry. And that's why they suppressed them, because they needed, you know, huge plains so they can uh, get the sheep to graze and then that would help the wool industry. Um, in the same way, you could argue that the rubble wall in Malta has an emblematic value, which perhaps in the last 30 or 40 years, it's gained an even more radical sense, considering how savage development has destroyed many rubble walls and fields. Some of the old rubble walls were destroyed by development. In the same way that the land clearances of the 18th and 19th century changed the Scotland landscape and polity. So you could argue that the, the, the destruction of the Seyir, the world Hetanta Seyir, is also actually having a huge impact in terms of how we see ourselves as polity, how we engage in our own you know, sense of physicality within the island. Should I say the islands? 
and good mass. So it is also within this imaginary that I found the notion of a sayyia has a powerful image and signifier of thinking, but more specifically of thinking and speaking the Maltese. This has a phenomenological value in that the rubble wall is an immersive experience. One cannot simply look at the rubble wall. One must walk along and through the fields while also becoming extremely sentient, aware of the life that seems to gain meaning from the interstitial character of these structures. Again, speaking as a visual artist, I grew up drawing and painting images of fields and rubble walls. You know, if you're an artist in Malta, the first thing you start doing is paint and draw rubble walls. But I was also being always struck by their presence, as I would then find when I read a lot of Mediterranean literature, especially Sicilian literature, and how the vegetation and the trees, like the carob tree, the haruba, but also the wildlife and shrubbery that inheres in the rubble walls, provide a universe of particulars which seems to continually recede the more one seeks to get closer to it. So in the same way, French anthropologists found in bricolage, the race work of narratives that could be woven in every creative form of argument. So we find in Seyir, in the rubble, in the bocage of rubble walls, the whole structure of rubble walls, a system of possible and poor spaces that allows us to think in an array of manners. These makings and deeds are found in the unique interstices left by the relative position taken by each stone, where an infinite diversity of probabilities, paradox and aporia proliferate into an equally infinite and probable number of possibilities. So in like manner, I seek possibilities in the imaginary of abstinence, or rather the symbolic image of the slow growth of nature's cycle, which language seems to retain in its engagement with life and with life's own process. In Maltese, we say that snails go fasting. The babush, the more saya, okay, it's saya. For fact, as we know, when, when winter, the first strain of winter comes in, we, we go out and pick up all these, um, you know, these snails to cook them, basically. So hibernation, however, is not the same as fasting in this case, because we have also traditionally collected snails after the first rain when they come out and we collect them to cook them. And the fa they fast for us, so to speak, because once fasted, if that's a word, the snail gains culinary, more culinary value. They're much better tasted. Now, where is this image of the snail coming from? The image of the snail comes from, if you read the book actually, from the poem, um, of the, the, the lament to Sanchez Mejias by Federico Garcia Lortas, where, where he talks about the, um, the whole idea of the caracolas, the, 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 the snails, which are kind of, you know, waking up in the first, first uh, dew, the first rain of winter or of the fall of, the, of autumn. So Garcia Lorca frequently includes the snails when singing his poetic vision of life. And this is entwined with the seasons and the sense by which we experience the world phenomenologically, which is related to this poetic approach to the season and the surroundings. Now, I do not want to come across a kind of sentimental person here or someone who is a naturalist, but actually it is important to look at this narrative, this imaginary, because this is what I mean by the Mediterranean imaginary. So rather, I want to bring in the interplay between the imminent and what we seek to transcend using the model of art, which is sustaining its own immanence and autonomy, the artwork embodies that which humans transcend and project their understanding and anticipation by not simply taking an experience uncritically. So this criticality, if you like, of this aporetic character of art as that immanent activity, which also transcends immediate experience, is found in what I have just cited above as I speak of the sense of the makings and deed, deeds found in the unique interstices left by the relative position taken by a stone of the Seir, where an infinite diversity of probabilities, paradox, and aporia proliferate in an equally infinite and probable number of possibilities. It is in the sense that if I want to make an argument by speaking a language where I'm not being simply poetic or religious or artistic, but also I want to be rational and analytical in the same language. And I am doing so in a way that allows display between immanence and transcendence to happen. So in the scent, the real, of wet soil of the first autumn rains, 
we are reminded that time does not stop, but keeps going. What passes will return, though not as a form of existence, but as memory. Like language, these other forms of life present us with the plurality of the self as a real form that gives rise to possibility per se, a possibility that cannot expire because otherwise it is no longer a possibility, neither with the death of the body nor with the vanishing of the soul. As such, possibility bears no space or time. And this placement here becomes quite central to the whole thing. So this interstitial abstinence, an abstinence that is from becoming limited by assumptions which simply impose categories of thinking in multiple ways, does not come cheap. It costs and its price is neither pecuniary nor moral. Rather, the value is concrete in the sense that it has an impact on one's own sense of living. Not just being, but living in the quotidian sense, in terms of how one asserts one's autonomy against all the restrictions that are expected of us. I am specifically thinking of a sense of displacement where one's sense of belonging is pretty much like that of immanence, expressed, articulated by talk, gesture, image, sound, etc., by a constant yearning for movement and transcendence. The aporetic relationship between the inside and outside, interiority and externality, is not unique to the Mediterranean sensibility. However, it is also true that the Mediterranean sensibility in its literature, in its arts, in its philosophy, has been characterized by such a continuous dialectic between what appears to be fleeting and what seems to be permanent. But here's a qualifier for such a dialectic, which sometimes also becomes asymptotic. In effect, there is no binary how a relationship like that between immanence and transcendence works. So I do not want anyone to think that in this apparent pairing, we have some Cartesian, Cartesian dualism. Neither should this be seen as an attempt to impose a monistic view. The limitations of language here come to mind, which is where and why this book takes the character it takes. So in Sayyid al I take my interests in many directions, even when I know that these directions can be traced back into a juncture of possibilities, which not unlike a rubble wall, bring together the most unlikely shapes and forms that would at first sight appear to be neither complementary nor have any chance of working together. The porous notion and the character by which this uncharacteristic ensemble is brought together and how it ultimately works is at the core of what I'm trying to bring in focus when I discuss the nature of contingency, that is the image and feeling of the limit, which is the only way by which one could gain a sense of freedom. Thanks to the ambiguity of the I as being, what is revealed comes about only in what is recognized in what we cannot show in the absolute or its totality. That is, as the, as at the moment in which we realize that what we want as total is only partial and will remain thus because the totality of the I, qua being, is reached only when, as an individual, one arrives at the moment that ends with the presence of the living person in this world, that is, when a person dies. So if we are to speak of a sense of freedom, we have to articulate it, as it were, by the facility which we gain from, the embracing, from embracing the limit. The way to do that, or rather the way to express such a sense of freedom, immediately comes from a sense of ambiguity. The ambiguity which the language gives us in terms of how we grapple with a sense of being. In this case, with how in Maltese, the I, il yin, denotes both I am, but also being, as in the French être. Some have used the word keun for being, but I'm still not sure, even when I remain open to it, in terms of the infinitive of kian. I leave that to you, and maybe the experts in the Maltese language could tell me whether I'm right or wrong here. Now, this, gives, this limit gives us as much more expansive view of what being means in the mark, what the Italians call impostazione, in a linguistic context. What we regard as a limitation of language comes from the reducible and essentialist approach which only seeks translatability. But as I said earlier here, I'm not particularly interested in translatability. In a generative process by which language gives me a peculiar and specific ways of thinking and reasoning that belong to the immersive sense that I gain. So if we are to speak of a limit in the sense of how we find ourselves existing or exiting rather, leaving behind, exiting, going out. The boundaries which have been imposed on us historically and pedagogically, not to mention other realms of power such as morality and reason, 
the opposite comes true. Instead of limitation, we gain a whole horizon of new possibilities. Now, these possibilities cannot be curtailed by a desire to gain a sense of totality, which is often assumed as the only way by which we can make meaning. As we have been schooled in the obsession of having to give and deliver the right answer, and as we have been told as children and young adults, even at university, that we can only succeed if we successfully fulfill and pass a process of assessment that expects a specific form of behavior and reasoning, and by which we show that we have the answers. In other words, as we remain firmly schooled and never encouraged to disestablish knowledge, even when we have the means to do so by the very language that we speak and inherent meaning, it remains very difficult for us to do so. What I'm trying to say here is the Maltese is quite, quite a very interesting, gives us all these possibilities to be able to de disestablish some of these educational schooled contexts. Now, this is where we have to go back to the sense by which Viredu and Apia takes the argument for decolonization, perhaps even when they appear to take different strategies in doing so. I do not want to diverge or you know, go into an argument on decolonization language and the curriculum and the whole epistemological armature on which we have structured and scaffolded learning, but one cannot help noticing how we often abdicate from the linguistic expanse which we could gain as we turn on its head the very assumptions of limitation that continue to be imposed on us. The fear to get it wrong in one's own language comes from the assumption that other languages, mostly to do with the old colonial masters, can do better. Yet we know that, we, what, that what we have in terms of the other languages is another set of rules, if not another grammar, which historically have been imposed on us as the only measure of reason. Though as Apia reminds us, language is just a synecdoche. Perhaps the reason why we put so much bearing on it is not because we fail to understand it as such, but because other totalizing values have been put on a language per se. So you will be right to think that here I am suddenly contradicting myself, but in effect, I am only showing that the moment in which we realize that we want other than a totality to give us the certainty of our existence, we realize that if we take language as a microcosm or a skew into how we think, then we could begin to understand how and what is often seen as a limit. Uh, this also means that by the, expression, the expansion and expansive possibilities that are open, the nomadic senses of existence by languages, for example, or by our own language, here uh, we could find ourselves actually located within the Mediterranean imagining. And this is, um, this is that part which, which deals with that. But the sense by which the aporia of imminent transcendence works is partly to do with the finality, indeed the limit, which is the only articulation of one's freedom and her sense of liberty is often at odds with what we consider to be beyond possibility. This is what I mean. By... Sorry? There's some feedback. I think you read the rustling your papers. There's some issue with the sound. Okay, thanks for telling me because I'm not sure what's going on on the other side. So let me... Sorry to interrupt. Oh. So, yeah, the sense by which the aporia of imminent transcendence works is partly to do with the finality, indeed the limit, which is the only articulation of one's freedom and whose sense of liberty is often at odds with what we consider as being beyond possibility. This is what I mean by the internalization of displacement in which in the Mediterranean imaginary is often characterized by images of pilgrims, migrants, and refugees, as I discussed at some point in this book. In fact, actually, I've been working on a paper, or rather, I worked on a paper which takes the idea of the pilgrim, migrant, and the refugee through the lines of Socrates, St. Paul, and Cavavis. And where what used to be an interchangeable role has now become fragmented and rendered impossible by the politics of borders, and where the Mediterranean often finds itself becoming a bloodbath. There is in this sense an Odyssean character to the aporetic relationship which I take from limit and freedom to that of immanence and transcendence, where the experience of being and speaking turns on its own head and implodes. This is also brings me to what I promised in my abstract of this paper, where I argued that with this in mind, I wanted to reflect on the process of writing a Maltese as a means by which contingency as an approach to living and thinking remains core to the understanding of how the self is immersed in what we broadly identify with the poetics and therefore the making of the Mediterranean imaginary. 
as an imaginary where several images and figures of thought and experience come together in the myths by which human beings have always tried to make sense of their existence. So Nietzsche and the eternal return meet Oedipus and free him from the cruel gods. It is a return home that lasts forever and does not repeat everything or every time. This embodies a homecoming, an ostos, that looks forward an avant nostalgia. 20 years ago, I wrote a book about avant nostalgia. And if you want a copy, I can send you an, an, a PDF of it because I'm quite fond of it because it allowed me to look at these things in a very different way. So the poet and the philosopher come together to ward off the world from God, from the gods of the dystopian polis. Together, they go away like Odysseus and with Odysseus. But also wrote the book, there, there's, you know, that chapter actually really is very much um, a kind of an imaginary conversation with, with these characters. So by way of concluding these brief reflections, and we can dedicate a whole series of seminars on these themes if you want to, I'll take it. <laughs> I want to briefly dwell on how in the fifth chapter of this book, I suggest that the sense of displacement, which I explore through an imaginary engagement and dialogue with Odysseus and Calypso, which also bring in other figures, which represent the Mediterranean imaginary like Oedipus and Jocasta, but also Penelope, the sense by which we could gain time in pushing back against while embracing the limits, the immanence, that define and ultimately shape our sense of freedom. So to ask how time is regained by the stealth of art's aporia is also to ask what exactly is lost over time in this deliberate claim over the limits of historical contingency. But this is not a rhetorical question. Rather, in what we assume to be lost, we find explanations and answers that are shaped by what we once had. That is the assumptions, that is of the belongings, which may or may not be true, and some of which may well not be entirely benign. Here I am thinking of the thorny issue of identity and how often belonging is turned into an instrument of oppression and exclusion, as we have seen in how the pilgrim, the migrant and the refugee no longer share the same fate and the same sense of convivial expectations. These days, the migrant and the pilgrim become antagonistic to each other. The refugee and the migrant become antagonistic to each other. So the whole idea that pilgrimage and migrancy and seeking refuge were one and the same thing, especially in the, the, the crossovers and the cross, cross, you know, within the Mediterranean, that has kind of disappeared. So what we cherish today, what we have left behind, may well be the source of a myth by which pushing back on our limits falls in the danger of exclusion in forms of nationalism, in forms of racism and oppression. Thus the question must be, what exactly was lost if we didn't know what we were going to lose? Perhaps to rephrase the same question, what can we lose? Or what can we not afford to lose? Surely what we can't afford to lose is the way by which we embrace the contingent and displacement itself. So when we conclude that in every possible way we are overcome rather than just being held by a momentary act, by historical contingency, we need to ascertain whether this provides an opportunity to free us from the myth of certainty or whether by history, we have something else in mind. Whether this history appears to be unique or is just a moment within many moments of several histories. <clears throat> so at this stage, I want to leave you with the thought of how we often compensate to the limit with the sense of the divine which in this book was never intended to be the case. However, I also wanted to draw your attention with how I chose to end my book, which in many ways is an invitation to think of how we do tend to compensate for historical contingency with a sense of divinity. Here I use the idea of the name, Hashem, listen, in the same way that the Jewish faith uses Hashem as one of the ways, of the ways it refers to God. However, it should be noted that unlike Adonai in Yahweh, Hashem is a connotic concept, a connotic name, in both its import and in its sense of the divine. And therefore, it entertains a sense of transcendence that retains the immanence and interiority of the self, pretty much in the same way that the theologian Paul Tillich refers to the sense of depth of being when he discusses the notion of the divine. 
I see this as rather impossible without gaining a sense of the depth by which we speak. And here I would add that the strength of being gained from language is quite close to the image of the divine's smile, almost a sense by which one begins to understand how the aporia of imminent transcendence begins to give further meaning to the idea of the limit as a form of freedom. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, John. Uh, thank you so much for that very uh, enlightening uh, talk. Um, I'm sure that uh, there are a number of um, questions that uh, are going to be raised from, from the participants. So uh, the floor is open. Please feel free to ask John any question you might you might have. Oh, Jean Paul. Thanks for that, uh, John. I mean, a number of thoughts came as I uh, was listening to your presentation. First, of course, I am definitely now intrigued to read the book. Before I was tempted, now I am definitely going to go look for it at the book fair, which is happening on now. <laughs> so hopefully I'll get that copy. But uh, I kind of uh, read it along two parallel lines. On the one hand, it is an exercise that seems to be very much an adventure in the philosophy of language and the decolonizing potential in uh, thinking through language in a way. And um, for me, it was also, I think, implicitly perhaps, not so much explicitly, also makes a, uh, an important contribution to, uh, I suppose, uh, the philosophy of mind, not least of which because uh, I think it highlights a way of doing philosophy, which emphasizes the point whereby thinking happens analogically. And I remember a paper by Tambaya how uh, even science proceeds by virtue of analogy and how scientific thinking proceeds uh, even then analogically. And I think your um, exercise drawing upon the Seir uh, itself uh, shows us a way by which this analogical thinking can proceed, which carries its own intrinsic poetry and its own intrinsic aesthetic rooted also as it is from the Mediterranean, let's say roots from which your own upbringing comes and uh, which emerge through the way you construct and build this sort of rich tapestry from the snails to the uh, rubble walls. All of this constructs a landscape, if you will, of thought and the way in which analogically this proceeds. And that was quite an interesting, uh, I think, lesson, if you will, on how uh, thought can proceed through analogy. And the, uh, the second sort of parallel I found is uh, I'm also currently uh, just finished the work I have to present next week. I'm working, I'm an anthropologist by, uh, by let's say, by trade. And uh, it struck me how some of the questions that you started off your presentation, and that is the what started off as how difficult it is to translate certain philosophical concepts across other languages simply because other languages do not think of these things in the same way, and therefore implicitly the people who are shaped through these languages do not conceive of these things in a similar way. One of the fundamental things, let's call it a thing, is this notion of the self, right? And this notion of the self, how can you begin to translate Descartes in other languages? So what starts as a problem of cultural translation actually comes to an anthropological question, right? Do we conceive of the self as a uh, cultural universal or is the uh, notion of the self so irredeemably uh, culturally contingent, not simply historically contingent, but ultimately culturally contingent that there is no way we can actually begin to assume these uh, this kind of uh, universal concept with which to work something as fundamental as the self and when you gave the examples i from my own field work in, in south korea i can tell you there is at least uh, seven or eight different ways to speak about the i as we understand it and they are all fundamentally relational and they change in the context of who you are speaking to and uh, who you are speaking about. And you do a different version of the 
first person singular pronoun. And this has been a way in which anthropologists have began, including myself, have begun to approach this question of the self and the universality of the self. And um, sort of it strikes me whether or not, uh, in a way, you started off your paper there, but you didn't take us then to the, let's say, to the anthropological observations with regards to the Maltese language itself. So does the Maltese language, you attempt and provide your own translations of some of these concepts, like the self, right, you say the alien. Right? And uh, in a way, you start off telling us that in certain African languages, uh, this cannot, does not quite work because it has to also be associated to something, to be what. And yet in your own writing, then you come back to a notion of the self without having read the book. So disclaimer there, but from what you presented, the excerpts that you presented, you refer to a notion of the yin, which again seems to try to translate that context-free, independent idea of the self. So I don't know what this tells us. Does this tell us that in a way the Maltese, does the Maltese language therefore have a sense of self similar to that of its colonial, uh, let's say heritage, the languages of its colonial heritage, or uh, that in fact it has something different and what you're trying to do is see if you can use the language to translate that which is culturally untranslatable. Yeah. But these are just some thoughts. No, I mean, the, the, well, actually, I mean, it's kind of interesting because, you know, that Weredo thing, I read it when I was still at Warwick. So this is like 20 years ago. And I remember using it for music to try to understand that, partly because I was coming from, you know, my, my study, my, my doctorate was very much focused on George Lukács and Theodore Adorno and all the dialectic and all that stuff. But I mean, the, 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 the other thing is, is like Weredo, like all of us probably, I don't know, but is that, again, I'm not an, an anthropologist, although there was somewhere in the back there also Clifford Geertz and all the others, but I didn't want to bring them up because that would have become a bit more complicated. But if you read the book, um, you definitely find that there is an attempt, what you say, but also an attempt to move away from that. So for example, I keep talking about yin yit, yin yit, which is a bit strange. How can you explain a yin yit? Um, but I mean, uh, and all of that stuff, but it does also show that perhaps we are still trapped with thinking that because we learned philosophy, because we learned maths, uh, we learned all sorts of stuff in English, um, we, we feel compelled that actually that's only the way we can do philosophy, for example. And so we had to try to translate, which I tried not to do. And that's why I said, this is a book of philosophy rather than a book on philosophy. But also the attempt was, you know, as you know, I wrote many books and all the other books were all in English. So, I mean, strictly speaking, I always felt that there was that kind of tension. The other thing I should mention is that when colleagues of mine who come from either Italy or Portugal or they speak a Romance language, um, I never heard anyone who speaks Arabic who told me this, but people who speak Romance languages, when they read my books, they always tell me, once someone told me, you wrote your book in English, but actually that book is not in English. It's in Italian or it's in Spanish. And I always find that also when working with students who come from um, not the Anglo-Saxon tradition, but who study their philosophy in different languages or like, for example, Greek students, I always, and especially because they were art students, they would come here. So they would have an engagement with, with concepts in a slightly different way. They would use the image. They would use expression in order to do that. But then they have to write essays in English. And I remember a lot, especially um, Greek students um, who would be very frustrated by this whole thing because they say, I want to say something, but I can't do it. And I have to kind of so, because they feel that the Anglo-Saxon, which is much more positivistic and all that stuff. No, I'm not, no I love English, don't get me wrong, um, is, is restrictive for them because they can't really explain it. So, I mean, as most of us who have taught non-English speakers, you end up becoming also a copy editor in these cases. But I mean, I could see when doing this, I learned a lot from, there's a kind of a pattern of thinking, which I always felt that they were very similar to, 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 to Maltese in a way, but also slightly different. And that's the whole thing of this. What you're saying is quite interesting, whether we should solve this um, you know, anthropologically, I don't know, but definitely I think we are as Maltese missing an opportunity here because we shouldn't, I mean, I know there are a lot of trans, I admire these colleagues in Malta. I mean, I see it on Facebook who translate just about everything in Maltese these days. And that's really lovely because when I was a kid, I used to, to, to be jealous of the Italians who, who learned everything in Italian. So I wish I could do that. When, once when I became a teacher teaching in primary school, I remember 
teaching the kids, trying an experiment with them, teach them maths and in Maltese. And in those days, they streamed them. So these were kids considered to be weak, quote unquote. When I did all in Maltese, they could, numeracy was fantastic for them. They could just, you know, understand it like that. Suddenly, when we had to do maths in English, they couldn't get it. And I remember when I was their age, I couldn't get it either. So, I mean, it's a profound thing because if you think about how I learned numeracy, I learned numeracy in another language, which did not have any relevance to me because I was speaking in Maltese at home and I was living speaking Maltese. That becomes quite interesting. So I don't want to kind of, you know, as Apia was saying, it's not just a question of decolonizing and we, because we use Maltese, then we solve the problem. It's how are we going to use Maltese? And also whether that opportunity, we're gaining it, particularly if you then protract it and enlarge it in the context of the Mediterranean, which I think we keep missing out on partly because of political reasons, partly because also that we're still within that kind of colonial mindset, which as we know, under colonial, especially with the British, Malta was a garrison, so it couldn't even relate to the Mediterranean in, in such an open way that others could. So when you, when you talk to colleagues and students who come from Greece and stuff like that, who had a totally different approach, I wouldn't say you feel jealous, but you feel that there are opportunities which we have, more, which we have lost. So basically when I wrote this book, it was more to do with an exercise of engaging with these concepts in Maltese. But as you say, there is that other thing which keeps pushing you back and saying, okay, if I'm going to quote Husserl or I'm going to quote, I don't know, Wittgenstein, who actually wrote the stuff in different languages, but you know, I'm accessing it in English or in Italian or something like that. How on earth are I going to translate that in Maltese? And when you translate it, more, suddenly it becomes something different. It becomes so interesting because actually it opens up other possibilities. I wish I could speak Arabic, because I think, I keep thinking that if I knew Arabic, maybe some of the concepts that we engage with, which we are used to engage with in English or Italian or French or even German for those who speak it, maybe they, they would become very different. So, so that's, that's the whole thing. But what you say is totally true because there is a tension there when you try to do this exercise, especially if we come like us, we have been altered. And in my case, I'm even working in an English speaking place. Where, where there's that kind of thing. So, I mean, am I thinking of Maltese or do I start? I remember when I went to Britain the first time and when I moved to Britain, one of the things which happened to me, at some point I started dreaming in English as well. And I thought, okay, I'm getting there now. But that's a very bizarre thing because at first I was really struggling, you know, I mean, in terms of I'm thinking in a different language, but yet I'm engaging with these people in a, in a language which, which, okay, I know, but I cannot really grasp it kind of, you know, phenomenologically speaking, so yeah. So thanks for that. I'm totally, you're totally right. And I hope when you read the book, you, we can have more of a conversation because I'm really, you know, I really want to know what, what people who read this book make of, make of it, because I'm sure that there are other questions there and that, that there are also issues which, which need to be, really need to be had. Thank you, John. Questions? I was, if I, if I, if you allow me, I was, um, actually you asked a question, and I was um, uh, thinking about it while you were talking, uh, or you, where you were giving the, your, 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 your speech. Actually, um, this is the question of how we managed to uh, do away with Italian um, and practically take up English to the extent that wherever you go in Malta, and this applies particularly to, to some people of, of, of maybe of the older generation, but even of, to others who actually, even in Malta, they have difficulty even to have a cup of coffee because they are expected to speak in English to the waiters and to the people who, who are actually running restaurants and so on. Um, and these people, because if you speak to them, you find that it's very annoying because uh, these people do not express themselves in any other language but Maltese. Um, despite the fact that sometimes they even know a little bit of English, but anyway, um, this this transfer of uh, of from 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 Italian, especially to English. Um, is something which has always has has been of, of, of interest to me because I, I'm interested in the social history of language, and it has always concerned me because um, I notice that when people learn Italian and you know Maltese people learn Italian, it for them it's kind of a natural consequence. Probably you mentioned Arabic just now. 
probably you'd find the same situation with Arabic as well. I don't know. I remember when I went for my doc for my doctoral studies a long time ago. My supervisor was surprised. He told me, "How come you never studied Arabic? How is it possible?" This was in the very early nineties, ninety one or ninety two. I can't remember. Um, in fact, I he made me think about this, and in fact, I realized how foolish it was of me never to bother to study Arabic. Um, and it's true, um, we are very much exposed to Arabic because of the language and even to Italian. We are bombarded by these two cultures and yet for some very strange reason, we have kept them out of our, of our system um, and we opted for, for, for English. Obviously, it's the language of the colonizer. The colonizer himself had a very hard time to make us adopt English, actually. Um, for example, not many people in Malta realize that for the first 80, 90 years of British colonial, colonial uh, of the British colonial, colonial times, they actually even published the Malta Government Guides Act in both Italian and, and English. Um, well, it, it kept going until the 1920s, really, this issue. Um, and it, it's very interesting how we managed to do away with cultures which are with, to which we were accustomed for not generations, but perhaps thousands of years. I don't know in the case of Arabic. And yet we have managed over a thousand years, and yet we have managed to, to do away with them in favor of a language which was, strictly speaking, I'm sorry to say this, but strictly speaking, imposed on us. Um, and this is something which I think deserves further, um, further analysis, uh, especially in this post-colonial phase that we are going through at the moment. Um, for example, one of the things which I find very annoying at the University of Malta was that whenever they, you know, you, 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 uh, you, uh, you apply, to become an associate professor or a professor, it has to go through the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Now, the Association of Common, in my case, I learned later on that they were sent to, 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 the, to, to, to the vice chancellor of the, in, in the case of the professor, uh, it was sent to the, the, to the vice chancellor of the University of London. But I was writing mostly about Malta and about Mediterranean history and all the rest. What has, he, what has he got to do with my studies, really? Uh, with all due respect, he decided to send them here and there and so on. I know this because I met him at a conference and he told me. But then I said, but why is it that these papers have to be sent to an Englishman who lives in London, who has absolutely no, no, no knowledge of my culture, strictly speaking, or very little if he has. Um, he never lived in, my, in, in the Mediterranean, probably. Probably, I don't know. And, and this is something which really concerns me personally um, as a Maltese, because this makes me think, where are we actually? Where, where, what are we doing with our society? Where are we going? What is the situation that we are living in? Where, where do we want to go from here? I don't think we have as yet began to answer or to, the, to, to think, not even to think about these questions, let alone to answer them. I don't know, I don't want to take any more of your time. I don't know whether there is a question here, honestly. I just wanted to express this idea with you. No, thanks. Um, I think the institutional issue is, is, is what it is, but I also should remind, you know, I realized when I went to Britain that even though we know English, I don't think we speak English as such. So, I mean, it takes, for, for those of us, you know, I'm, maybe others who had the same experience is that when you go to an English speaking country and then you start working there and also start teaching, it becomes interesting in terms of how the, the, the process of thinking actually. So Maltese, although there are a lot of people who speak English or whatever it is, I don't think that they naturally think in English. I think they think in a different way. So, and maybe Jean-Paul could explain this in, a, in an anthropological way, that the language in and of itself is there, but actually, and, and so I find that there is that kind of disconnect sometimes. Because when, you know, when having moved to an English speaking country, I had to really change a lot of the ways I think and how I process. And I was very grateful to my doctoral 
supervisor, Fred Inglis, who actually taught me how to, how to, to argue in English, not that I couldn't do it, but basically is that the, the frame of mind is very different. So you become kind of, you know, and that not to mention coming to the United States. So, I mean, you have those, those uh, because, you know, English is a very positivist kind of very empirical language. Whereas, but I don't know. I mean, maybe Jean-Paul could say something about this because I know, uh, I, I can't explain it exactly, but I know exactly what you mean. By the way, when I was in the eighties, I was, um, <laughs> I got special permission to write my B.Ed dissertation in Malta, in Maltese. So partly because it was on futurism and I told them all the documents we have in the library, I hope they're still there, were original from La Cerba and all that stuff, which Marinetti used to publish. They told them it's all Italian, it translates better in Maltese than in English. And I didn't like the translations of the, the futurist manifestos in English, it didn't make sense. There was a lot of phonetic stuff going on because of the, the poetry and the parole libre and all that stuff. And eventually I got permission, but I mean, apparently that was quite unique, so. <laughs> So, yeah, Jean-Paul wanted to say um, he's got his raised, hands raised. Yes, thanks. I, I finally figured out how to do it with this version of um, Zoom. Sorry. I don't have to put it down, so apology. Um, I just I had a reaction to what uh, Cam was just saying, but also to the point that you have done, done to answer Cam. Um, you know, Kam was saying, you know, he wish he learned sort of Arabic. That would have helped uh, him a lot. And also ask himself, why not? And uh, this is, I think, what highlights the peculiar challenge, I think, of what something that you are trying to do here brings to the foreground. If we make the point that a lot of how we think about who we are and our notion of self is bound to the form of our language, not simply because of the idiomatic, let's say, tendencies of the language, but also deeply rooted in the very, in the very grammar over and above the, the, the semantics of it, that these fundamentally structure not only the way we speak, but also the way we think. And additionally, I would also say the way we conceive of ourselves, right? So it is so profoundly rooted in language. And try to elevate this, not simply within, let's call it a more national context, where you're looking at Malta and Maltese language and the sphere of, of the Maltese language, but trying then to suggest that one can actually also move towards Mediterranean modes. It even exponentially makes the uh, sort of the contradiction and the difficulties of the point you are trying to make insofar as Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, Spanish, Maltese. Yeah. I mean, the, the level of, sure, and languages have historically borrowed from each other, fine, all well and good, but if you're going to make a point for the peculiarity of them and the, let's say, the idiosyncratic or the, let's say, the contingency of the self as born out of language, which is something I would share with your, with your view, that uh, the self is contingent on, in a profound way, on language, then uh, how can one actually ever get to aspire towards developing a sense of a, uh, a Mediterranean dimension to it when these things are so intrinsically wedded in the language they're from. And this is the point that we are also making here. And so this is just one little um, reflection and as an aside. But the other thing I wanted to add was, you know, anthropologists have long made the point that, you know, colonization starts by uh, the colonization of the self. That is one of the most profound and deep rooted effects that you have in colonization is the alteration of the mode in which the self is perceived and understood, whether it's through the introduction of conceptions of private property, right, where the self needed to educate, you know, the Native American self needed to be reconfigured where their relationship to uh, to land and products of the land is conceived in terms of private possession and property, hence the radical threats of something like the potlatch in Native American context. Whether you look at it in the in conceptions in, say, even not even British American colonialism, right? So we're looking at it also in East Asian forms of colonialism and Japan, Japanese uh, colonial endeavors, which sought to transform the self of uh, their Asian neighbors by for reconfiguring a whole different system of kinship because the, the way which kinship is understood, because of course their sense of self was radically tied to the way in which they structured ideas of kin and kin relations. 
So in reshaping the system of kin and introducing particular systems of kinship reckoning, they sought to alter and shape the understanding of the self that mirrors and is an extension of their own conceptions and understanding of the self. And language is formative, so kinship names in that regard, they change the structure of kinship name. So this idea that the uh, colonization proceeds through the colonization of the self has been something that's been quite sort of well researched in anthropology when looking at different modes of colonization, benign ones as well, mind you, because not all colonization is intended to conquer. Sometimes colonization, as I suppose perhaps in your clerical training, you have the occasion to encounter forms of colonization it can also happen with the benign intent to save mm. people's souls as well as people's lives. Nevertheless, it is also a technology of power in altering the self conversion and forms of conversion being another form in which selves are re-altered and reimagined and transformed. But then let us not also underestimate the capacity to also work with these colonizers' concepts, with these colonizing languages, and also use them ironically, right? Without necessarily being subsumed under their sort of hegemonic valencies, but rather themselves being vehicles for let's say even playful, perhaps an ironic resistance. So yes, in Maltese, we speak English, but we also speak Maltese. Are we dominated by our sense of the English language? Or has perhaps our facility to adopt the language that has historically been associated with globalization, capitalism, and all of the other big evils that you can conjure up, also allowed us to create a space through the way in which Maltese language is used, deployed, and enacted in forms of cultural intimacy allows us precisely a way to resist this. By being so proficient in it, we have also created that space, let's say, which exists underneath it, between it. I mean, the idea of la lingua della cucina and the Maltese, you know, the idea that it's a kitchen language, but a kitchen is a space of heart, it's a space of home, it's a space of intimacy, it's the space of in a sense, alterity to the radical official face of a colonial language, but just thoughts. I, there is the other thing, because we need to, I mean, I, I see it in the slightly, I don't know where the direction comes from, to be honest with you, because I'm not trying, I don't want to give the impression that the direction comes from because we speak Maltese, therefore we, we live like it. Actually, it's the other way around. I think language is a reflection of, so even when we speak English or we speak half English, half Maltese, or we have this patois of, of, which we have developed in Maltese English, it is also reflective of how we live and how we see the world and how, and in fact, actually noticing, especially from abroad, how Maltese itself has evolved. Uh, and we see social media and all the others, and also how English has evolved. It's very interesting. The other curious thing is why the Maltese still find Italian, as, as um, Carmel was saying, in terms of why Italian becomes so natural to us. Um, probably because of TV and all that stuff, we know more about, you know, when I speak to an Italian, tell him all about, you know, Gianni Morandi and all this stuff, so how do you know this stuff? So actually, I've never been properly to Italy, but we know that because of TV, so we grew up, and in fact, once I planned, but COVID blew it, I planned a whole lecture to give in Bologna on the whole idea of how Rai has influenced the Maltese imaginary in terms of its relationship with Italy, and how I always felt that I'm at home in Italy when I go Partly because, but even though I never lived there, and you wonder. But on the other hand, there's a certain kind of thing. Suddenly, you recoil back when you see certain mannerisms and certain approaches, which you cannot sort of really kind of understand because you think you know Italy, you think you know Britain, you think you know even Malta, but then you realize you don't. So I think there is that. But I mean, what I'm saying here is that these exercises, I wish we could we could do more of them. Partly because I think we're, we're missing out on certain great opportunities, especially in what we call quote unquote post colonial condition, not to mention the whole idea of now membership of the European Union, which I think is having an impact in, in, in all sorts of other things, is, is intriguing in terms of. I'm, so I'm not saying, you know, you know, I'm not a linguist, so I'm not saying where does this love leave Maltese as a language, but I'm thinking. When I thought about this, I'm born in Malta. I was so there is also a migrant issue for me. I was listening to John Portelli last week. We 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 uh, launched one of his books, which he originally wrote in Maltese and now it's translated in English, and it's launched in in in, in Toronto. And how all the, the colleagues and the students actually who come very much from Middle East and uh, but they're all Canadians, 
how they relate. And, and John and I we were talking about the Maltese experience, but also being away. I've been away for 30 years. He's been away for 40 years. And yet at some point you want to wipe out Malta and then you start realizing, hang on a minute, um, there's something else with Malta. So you start being wanting not to go back as such. Some people want to go back, others don't. But you feel a kinship with it, so I end up writing a book in Maltese. So I mean, because I didn't need to. And to be honest with you, you know, Carmel was talking about how universities use the stuff. Recently, I was talking to a colleague of mine in another university with a ten-year process, and they told him, "Don't write in Portuguese. Write only in English, because that doesn't count." And he felt really affronted by it because he said, "Why shouldn't I write in Portuguese when he's specializing in people like Paulo Freire, who wrote in Portuguese?" So I mean, there is also that politics of language, which, which. But what I mean by this is more to do with this whole issue of displacement, belonging, but also this Mediterranean context, which I looked at the Mediterranean more from literature, more from the arts. And I see there, and I remember, you know, I keep saying this, you read my makings of the sea. Um, I conclude that basically what people like Jean-Francois Lyotard are talking about when they talk about postmodernity, I say the Mediterranean has always been postmodern, so to speak, because modernity, postmodernity is modernity, it's on perpetual ascendancy. So it's not after modernity, it's actually in the, in the, in the beginning, in the emergence of modernity, you're already postmodern, so to speak. So it's that kind, and I always felt that the Mediterranean always operates like that. If you look at literature, if you look at all sorts of other things. So, I mean, that's where, where I'm coming from, although it's not easy to explain, um, but I know Rebecca wants us to ask a question and, or make a comment, which would be great. So I, I'll, yeah. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. First of all, for the for the lecture for the seminar, it was incredibly interesting. Um, just a few thoughts, actually, talking about uh, sort of the colonization colonization of the self. I I really feel that here in Malta we really have a crisis of belonging, and this is not something which is of course new. And that is why I feel that we latch on to any group or any entity which can make us feel like we belong. So whether that is the church or a political party or even a language. We align ourselves so wholeheartedly to that particular mindset that we forget to, to, in a way, to have a broader view, not only of the Mediterranean and our, our, our position within the Mediterranean, but our position on the island. And I think this makes it easier for us to accept the wholesale destruction of, of uh, swaths of land and uh, you know the rubble walls you mentioned, of course, which are emblematic of, of, of this destruction. And I think this, this really ties into what you mentioned earlier about the fear, the fear to get it wrong. And <clears throat> sorry, the fear to get it wrong in the sense um, of the fear to get it wrong in terms of critical thinking, in terms of going down sort of these routes, which um, perhaps our education system chastise us for going down some routes rather than others. They encourage sort of a, a certain mode of thinking rather than opening the boundaries. Um, they try and sort of limit thought through that uh, process, uh, you know. And you mentioned, you, you stated the idea of uh, disestablishment. And I think that if more, more people overcome, overcame the fear um, of uh, rocking the boat and lent themselves more towards disestablishing the system, then we'd have much more productive futures than we have at the moment. These are just some thoughts I had and I wanted to share. And thank you very much for, for your, your talk. Thanks for your... I mean, actually, that's why I, I, you know, Illich became so important to me because when he brings... I mean, he talks about him being the, the partly because of his parentage you know, he says, I'm a wandering Jew and a Christian pilgrim and all that stuff. And there, there is a lot of that stuff going on in terms of, of how these things come together. And also his methodology is interesting. I mean, what, the thing is worth mentioning the methodology because he mentions his methodology of how he looks at the present by actually bracketing. He uses the, 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 the notion of epochy, which we find in Husserl, but also we find in Christian thought, uh, where he would say, how do I do this? So, I mean, at some point he said he wanted to learn Chinese. He was a linguist, you know, he, he, he spoke all sorts of languages, but there was a point where he said, I wanted to learn Chinese just to shift myself away from where I am in order to go on a different world and, and then come back. But he said, I was, I'm not, now at that point, he was, he said, he is too old to learn another language. So basically he said, but, you know, in being a Latinist, so he decided to go back to the 12th century. He looked at some of the, do the documents in the 12th century and suddenly started looking at things which, which, um, which become totally different. So for example, I mean, the book is about reform contingency and this establishment, but I mean, the concept of reform, it's not the concept of reform as we know it, the empirical concept, which comes more from the Anglo-Saxon world, 
But it's a concept of reform which comes from St. Augustine. It comes from the patristic notions. And it's a concept of reform which is also um, rooted in the whole idea of perennial philosophy, which is very different, which is very scholastic, but it's very different in terms of that kind of... You know. So reform is a reaffirmation. It's almost like, you know, going back in terms of much more of an, uh, an Augustinian point of view rather than, you know, I don't know, uh, an empirical point of view. And that changes everything. So when people read this establishment, or when they read his The Schooling Society, they think he wants to close schools. But he's saying, no, I'm not talking like that. I'm talking about in the same way you, we need to disestablish the church in a, in a secular society, in a like society. We also need to disestablish the school. We need to disestablish politics. We need to disestablish just everything else. And in that context, that's a leap of faith. But partly, obviously, everything is against that, even language. So if you think about how can we disestablish Maltese, I remember when I, when I was at the University of Malta in the 80s, I used to ask questions in Maltese and they used to hear my, my friends, my students, fellow students moaning because I was not speaking in English. And it just, it, I used to find it very difficult at first. So, I mean, you know, I remember being very frustrated. I can write in English, but I mean, speaking it, I needed the, I didn't speak it at home. So, you know, but I mean, it was interesting. I always felt affronted by the fact that here I am, my university in Malta. Obviously I was a first generation graduate. So that makes it even, you know, different because we were, we were able to do it. And I know this is controversial, partly, and this is where the aporia and the irony comes in, that in as much as the student worker scheme, people said it was, you know, there were other things which were disastrous in it, but actually if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be able to go to university. So, I mean, there was all these kind of, even the politics, I grew up in a politics coming from the left, which I found myself outside all the political parties because I couldn't kind of connect with them because partly I could, I, 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 I wanted them to disestablish themselves. But I mean, I always found myself in the same situation where they would say, no, the, the, the kind of, you know, the canon of this particular institution, if you want to belong, you have to do this. And I say, no, I don't want to do that. So I, so the issue of belonging is interesting because, and this is why I keep talking about exiting and I wrote a whole book about art as exiting art's way out is because, <clears throat> you know, the walls, if you like, have protected us, but also have pushed us in. And they're not allowing that the people to come from outside. So everything become a foreigner, you know, the refugees, the, the immigrants, they, they, they're, they're Barani. So the Barani used to be the British. Now the Barani is the, the, the guy who looks a bit darker than me. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting, but then we forget that our own language is such a mix of, of different, and that's where the Mediterraneanity comes in. And I think the Mediterraneanity is such an important thing which we're missing out on. So we're missing out the Maltese, the fact that we speak in Maltese. I mean, here when they keep talking about, you know, race and they look at me and they say, you're white. I tell them, if I speak to you in my language, you wouldn't consider me white anymore. You think I'm an Arab or Jewish or something. In fact, actually when I'm in New York, they always think I'm Jewish. Um, and I say, and I'm proud of that because actually if you think about my language, I can tell you. Uh, and we speak English, but we speak Maltese. We so, I mean, so it's that kind of thing, but we don't seem to realize we're in it and we don't seem to realize it. It, it took me to go away, although I always knew that, but I mean, being away, I can think back on my own origin, quote unquote, and see this. And this is where I think it's so important. This is why I'm so passionate about it, but I'm not sure maybe being in Malta, that might not work. I don't know, I don't know. But here I'm talking to you and you, you can engage with me. So, I mean, it's not something which you have to be a migrant to understand it. But definitely being a migrant, being an immigrant, emigrant, a M, with a, not M, is interesting because, uh, you know, meeting the multi or going into Astoria in New York, suddenly you see all this, this universe there in one street, which makes you excited. But I mean, <laughs> or buying a pastiz for $2.50. So, I mean, <laughs> that kind of stuff. It's kind of strange, but yeah. I can't really explain it in an eloquent way, but you know what I mean. Yes, thank you. I think yes, being on the outside in several in several ways is is very productive because it allows you to see things which would have remained hidden uh, otherwise. And the, the the mic's off. And the hidden is important. As Norbert know, I written a page. I wrote a page um, a paper on the idea of the hidden in the apocryphos and the idea of, of uh, and both Kazantzakis, but also in, uh, in, um, in Kavathis, where we, we're talking about the hidden, but the apocryphal, but also the, and the choice. The choice is the heretic choice. Eres is in Greek, his choice. So, I mean, the hidden and the choice, but I mean, this is where I think in the Mediterranean imaginary, we share these things because when, you, when you're engaging with, with colleagues who are working with the Mediterranean culture or Mediterranean literature or, um, 
you know, you find a lot of commonalities in terms of, oh yes, of course, I can see that. Yes, the whole idea of aporia does not become difficult for them. And I always find that even though other cultures, and here the anthropologists might say, well, this is not unique to the Mediterranean. I don't think it is unique, but I think there is something which is unique to it in terms of how it comes together, which actually allows me, philosophically speaking, and I, I, my philosophy is more informed by the arts than by philosophy itself, in terms of these kind of ways of how we can think like that and how we can think outside the box and also how we can deal with paradoxes, with contradictions, which we can carry with us and which actually make a lot of sense. And I think, you know, starting with our language, it makes, it helps us do that. But I think we need to push it because I feel that we're not pushing it. Actually, it seems to be going somewhere else. And I feel we're losing it. You know, I, I get engaged with the Department of Maltese a lot. I'm really honored to do that in terms of looking at papers as an external examiner. And I'm almost always attracted by this, but I always say, there's, and I tell my colleagues in the Department of Maltese, there are these other opportunities like aesthetics, for example, why don't we push that? Why don't we do that? Because in Maltese, it could make so much more interesting reading, you know, we're talking about Jamil rather than just Bohia or something like that, or how can we push that? How can we, and th th there is always this kind of engagement that, and I get really excited reading um, you know, these dissertations in Maltese because they are confronting the same issues that I confronted when I wrote this book. They have to read all these books in English or in Italian or whatever, and then they bring them back into their own studies translated. But where is the actual translated? Where is the, what, what, what are we actually translating here? It gets interesting in terms of looking at it from Maltese literature or from, from an aesthetic. I mean, what, it is there such a thing as a, as, a, as an aesthetic which is prevalent in Malta or is that different or is that just universal? Because I'm here, I don't want to say that this is just be a particularistic thing. I'm not denying the cultural universes here. The, we are continuously doing that. Laclau has a very interesting concept about universals and that the universals are empty signifiers and what they're filled with is particular. So the universes are always going around, you know, almost like needing, universes are needy. I recently heard the rabbi saying that God is needy. He needs us to love him, so to speak. It's an interesting concept. So the whole idea of the needy at universal, which needs the particulars and all the contradictions to actually give them reality. And, that, and I think in a, in a, in a language, in, in the kind of relationship between the being and language it becomes quite an interesting um, concept, if you like. So again, I'm, I'm thinking aloud. John, uh, how do you think through the, the affinity between Bocage and the, the porousness of Bocage in relation to the Odyssean motif and the nomadic experience that 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 is implied within it? Is it a is it a transversal relation? And can we think of a Mediterranean imaginary as rallying around that kind of dialectic? Yeah, it's interesting because. I mean, I need to push that a bit more, and maybe we should have a conversation on it, uh, because bricolage is always seen as, you know, if you think about bricolage, it's, it's, you have these elements which you weave in, but let's think of the bricolage, you're in it, you're, you're somehow in the kind of the, 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 the bigger context of it. But also you are confronted with what Carmel was talking about in terms of these are walls, they are walling you, walling you in, but in a way, these walls are also porous. So these are walls, it's a bit like, you know, when we talk about, um, when we talk about things like um, boundaries, when we talk about frontiers, they are there and they, they, they help art articulate where we are, but on the other hand, they could actually close us in. So the Bocage thing seems to me, when you think about it as a system, actually it, it does articulate, it does get spaces, it does put spaces in there, but on the other hand, you're immersed in them, but on the other hand, they also allow you to kind of, there's a porousness which allows you to, to transcend that kind of limit. So it's the limit which is translated because the limit is allowing you to understand where the limit is, but also what you could do with it and how you could push it, so to speak. So, I mean, it goes back to the idea of Jaspers when he talks about transcendence. Jaspers is interesting because it doesn't even believe in, in a deity. So, so there is that thing. But I mean, I keep thinking whether, you know, in a way actually it was a speculative kind of suggestion that the, the concept of Bocage could become more attuned to what we do, because that's what we do in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean in and of itself is a closed sea, but on the other hand, it, it, it opens into, into the lands as well. But also what the, because when we say we're Mediterraneans, we don't live in the Mediterranean, we live in, on the land, which is 
surrounded by the Mediterranean or which, which has a border with them. So, I mean, how does that kind of, you know, relate to it? And I mean, I always find that pretty much articulated in the arts, in the lit in literature, especially in, uh, you know, in the visual arts. I mean, if you think about people like, you know, Guttuso, who was always considered to be heretical, even by the, his own communist party. And yet actually he was pushing boundaries all the time, even as a, he was never considered as an avant-gardist because he, he wasn't very happy with the avant-garde itself because it, it so he went back to old forms of, of realism. He went back to, to hybridity. I think it's that kind of hybridity, which I'm hoping that Bocage and hybridity could allow us to kind of come together and, and see how it works. And the whole idea of identity is important, especially in migrant societies like Spain, the United States or Canada or, or um, you know, or Australia, New Zealand, where you have that continuously happening at the same time in one street, if you like. And people feel as much as they are Canadians, they're also Maltese or Italian or, I don't know, Turkish or whatever. And, and yet, if you take, you know, a Canadian Maltese, as I have a lot of, you know, family in Australia, when you, they come back to Malta, probably I'm the same, when they come back to Malta, actually, they, they feel so out of place. Um, and yet they are Maltese because they need Malta to, to kind of define them as well. So there is a lot of interesting, um, but I mean, and it is almost like a form of bocage as well, because you have these walls, but on the other hand, there's this porousness going on. In the, so I don't, I, I don't think I have answered your question, but actually I would really love to discuss this further in terms of maybe we could make a paper out of it. Who knows? Yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll have a chat. Uh, yeah. It, the, 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 this, 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 this sort of dialectical elaboration. Well, I mean, the dialectic and the operatic in, in, in yeah. each other within the, the Mediterranean context. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank, you, thank you for, for elaborating on that. I, know, I don't know. I mean, here it's still 227. So it's, you're the people who are uh, late at the day. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless there are any other questions, um, we, can, we can wrap things up here. Okay. I'd like to thank you uh, very much, uh, John Baldacchino, for um, <laughs> a really, really stimulating uh, lecture. I'm sure there's um, widespread agreement across the audience that this has been very, very instructive um, to all of us. Um, including the, the debate that followed it. Uh, thank you so much for uh, collaborating with us, John. I'd like to thank the Metro Institute, the Institute of Maltese Studies. Uh, there will be other um, uh, exciting seminars uh, coming up. So please do, do watch, watch our spaces and, and hope to see you all again uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you so much once more, John. Thank you. Uh, please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, no, but can I just ask you, where will the recording be if we want to access it? Um, okay, uh, so uh, those of you who'd like to access the recording, please drop me an email and I'll send you the link to the recording. Okay, because I, I lost it. I lost internet for a short space, so I missed some of it. But okay, so I'll just send you an email. Great. Yes, yes, uh, I'll be sending you the link and the John, I will also send you the link to the recording for, for further dissemination. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone for attending and have a good See night. You all. Thank Bye. you.